So the first of those uh, two award uh, lectures is given by Ralph Schoenrich, uh, Schoenrich from the University of Oxford, Structure and History of the Milky Way. Thanks a lot. It's a great honor to be here. I would also like to thank a lot to Winton Capital for making these awards possible. Um, what I will have to do in this lecture is, of course, it's a very wide topic, and I'll try to just um, point out a few things that we will be able to do with Gaia and that we know about the history of the galaxy. Just to give a little overview of what is happening here, you see an ammonite next to the galaxy. It looks very simple, uh, similar, which is also why we call our field galactic paleontology, or some people prefer calling it galactic archaeology. What we can do with these data, okay, can I switch? Oh, okay, there is a tiny delay. This is my slide number three. Okay. Okay. Good. Well, <laughs> there's Schoenrich's law, which is derived from Murphy's law. Murphy said <laughs> the worst case always happens. Uh, Schoenrich's law is the worst case has already happened. We just <laughs> didn't know. Anyway, so in which situation are we currently in galactic astrophysics? What we have is probably the greatest revolution of all times in astronomy, which is within a few years, we are getting the Gaia photometric and astrometric survey of the entire sky, plus we have spectroscopic surveys uh, that cover millions of spectra of stars. So in our field, this means we are moving from sample sizes of 250 stars randomly selected by man um, with an unknown selection function to samples of millions of stars where we can study positions and chemistry and ages of the stars at high precision and where we can then disentangle the whole history and the workings, the inner workings of the galaxy. Also to mention, we have all these astroseismic surveys which deliver formidable ages for stars. And so what we are facing is an increase in sample sizes of a factor of 10,000 and an increase in the extent of our surveys um, by a factor of 100 or so. I've plotted here the galaxy overlaid with the footprint of Gaia. And what you can see here with colors is that for the first time, we can see a sizable portion of the galaxy. With the predecessor mission of Gaia, we would have seen some little dot here in the blue center that you wouldn't even see on the screen. So that is what we are facing. What can we do with this? Well, essentially, we can do three major things. We can study the structure of the galaxy, asking what is there, so trying to disentangle the single components. Here you see the galactic disk, it has a bar, and then you have the stuff around which we call the halo, and what I will show you, the bar has also an effect of producing something which we call the nuclear disk. And so study those components, analyze them for the first time, and then we can also um, decide how the stars are distributed in phase space, ages and chemistry, and by this map out how much dark matter is there. We will not only currently, we just know, okay, we have some need for dark matter, and we know this precise to perhaps 20% in the galaxy. With Gaia, we will map this out. So we will have a detailed map and can say at this place in the disk, we will need so and so much dark matter to account for the gravitational potential. Then the second thing is, of course, studying the physics of the whole system. So we have different things like chemical evolution, which is the enrichment of stars over time. We have the disk heating, so stars get born on near circular orbits and then get scattered by molecular clouds or by merging galaxies to more energetic orbits out of the disk. And um, we can also by this discuss what those impacts uh, do and how galactic structure affects the orbits of stars and redistributes them through the system. I'll quickly show you an example of this. And then, of course, 
once we know how those physics work with those data, we can actually write down, and this is why we call it galactic paleontology, we can write down the whole history of the system. We will know how much structure was in the past. We will know when galaxies have merged and what signatures this leaves. And of course, for people more in the popular science topic, we will know where the sun is coming from to pretty high precision in the system. Just, this is our concept of how our galaxy works. I'll um, capitalize on that a little bit later. Um, essentially, what you can say, you have a disk, you can mentally distribute this disk into rings that evolve next to each other, and those rings are connected. To sustain your star formation, you have to throw in gas from top, and uh, also from the side. So essentially, you accrete gas on top, and this drives an inflow through the disk. This inflow through the disk is important because stars in the disk evolve and die, and they enrich the medium with metals. And that means, because you have an inwards flow, it advects the metals, the heavier elements, and so the stars in the inner galaxy are richer in heavy elements than the stars in the outer galaxy. And we can use this to ask where are the stars born, and this relates to where they are found, and this tells us again about the structure and the redistribution. And then, as we are at the redistribution, we have two important processes there. One is the, what we call blurring. This is just the normal heating up of stars. They encounter a molecular cloud. This changes their orbit a bit, so they get increasingly eccentric orbits and diffuse a little bit through the galaxy. And some new process which we contributed to understanding and measuring for the first time, which is called churning. I'll show you that to you later. But churning is a large redistribution of angular momentum of stars into the galaxy. Let's just quickly discuss what we can do about the structure of the object. So this is just a sample. This is the first Gaia um, velocity distribution data, and I've just shown you two components, just to show you how detailed those data are nowadays. Um, the black arrow bars show Poisson errors on the x-axis, I have the V phi distribution, so the rotation velocity um, of the stars. And the disk rotates, so all disk stars are on the right side. You see a sample analytic distribution with a yellow line. And then the sample has a few halo stars. And when I multiply this with the errors, you get the black and red lines that explain the data already very nicely. That's the simplest model you can write down for such an object. This shows you two things. One, this is a first Gaia sample. This is just 100,000 stars. And even with 100,000 stars, you have still troubles to resolve the halo component of the galaxy because there are very few stars in the solar neighborhood. But when you have Gaia, you won't see those error bars here on the plot anymore. And the other thing is, Keep in mind, disks are rotating components, and this is important for a little finding that we had from the big surveys recently. I'm showing to you some um, gas model of Somani and Magorian, and they ins inserted a bar, and this is known when you have a bar in a galaxy, the non axisymmetric potential drives in a gas flow that runs along the bar. And when this gas flow meets the circular orbits in the middle of the bar, we call the long orbit X1 orbit alongside the bar, the inner one is an X2 disk, and when it comes close to the X2 disk, the gas can change over. What this bar does so is that it feeds gas into the nuclear disk. And we were a little bit struggling of understanding what this gas does. Does it get expelled? Do large amounts of it remain in the galaxy? And so we knew that gas was circulating on these orbits in the inner disk of the Milky Way, but we didn't have the stellar component. Now, Apogee, which is an infrared survey, infrared can pierce into the center. They don't have this extinction problem that hides the center from us. Gave us stellar spectra in the center of the galaxy. And when you look at a rotating disk, you always see the signal of uh, stars coming towards you on one side, look at the left plot, and stars going away from you at the other side. And in these data, in color, I show you this line of side motion. For the first time, we saw the rotation in the central part of the galaxy. And if I just show you these stars on a histogram in the inner uh, degree of the galaxy, you see that 
um, when you take the left side in blue and the right hand side in right, you can also select for higher extinction to get better disk stars. You clearly see the structure of a rotating disk in there. You can also do a couple of mock models with this. So that's the first time we observe this in stars. And what comes out of this, when you focus on this model, that's the one that fits best. We even see indication for a ring in this disk, just corresponding to what people like uh, Kreuzen et al. 2014 see in the gas motions. So the important thing there is we now know that there is significant star formation in the Milky Way nuclear disk, and it stays in a nuclear disk just like we observe in other galaxies. Okay, let's get a bit more complicated. Um, when you want to know the history of a system, what you want is particles that take part in the redistribution and that, however, are old and nearly indestructible, but formed at all times. And I don't know how many geologists are in here. Oh, I made a geology example for no geologists present. <laughs> um, okay, so for the non-geologists, what you see here is zirconia crystals. Um, the ladies in the room will know them at formidable um, pressure stones with a nice glare. And um, what they do is they live forever. And when you have that, you need to be able to measure the ages of your particles to know when they were born. And you need some other statistics, like the abundances in these particles, to tell where they are coming from. And then you can also look at abundance ratios, and this tells you the whole about a system. With that, geologists measure where rivers flowed at, in Gondwana, and they can measure where the magma in a volcano is coming from. Well, we have exactly the same. We have our stars. stars of the mass of the sun live virtually forever. We can determine the ages of stars very well, and so can relate the age of stars, this is the second plot, to their metallicity. And in this plot you have age to the right, 13 giga years is the age of the universe, so oh, 14, so nothing can be older than that. And what you see here is the disk stars, and you also see that they, which is on the vertical axis, have a different metallicity content. Metallicity means zero is solar abundance, minus one is a tenth of solar, plus 0.5 is theta times solar. And um, with this, as I said, stars that are above solar metallicity come from the inner galaxy. So now that you have that, you have stars from everywhere in the galaxy in your sample and can start analyzing those. And of course, then we have abundance ratios. I might discuss that later. OK, so this is just a model which does exactly the same thing as you see in this plot, just plot it the other way around, because we have model time running to the right. And you see when a galaxy starts off, it starts enriching very quickly in metallicity. This is just the low mass stars die very fast. They free all the iron. And so the galaxy enriches. And we see with the color gr gradient here where the stars are coming from. And here you also see how you can answer where the sun is coming from. Just look at the little black lines. We are there today. This is when the sun was born. So if you have a good model, you just have to go slightly above solar metallicity. You can put your cross in there and can read out where the sun should have been born. And what we find out is that the sun has to have come from about six kiloparsecs from the galactic center. This is surprising because nowadays we're at 8.3 kiloparsecs and the guiding center, so the radius around which the sun oscillates, is actually near 8.8 .8 kiloparsecs. So we will have to answer why that is, why the sun is coming from there and how it came there, although it's still on a near circular orbit, which is this. Um, this is a surfer, this, that's McNamara, and he is riding a wave. What does that have to do with the galaxy? Well, two things. Um, you also know how he entered this wave. He actually needs a jet ski because he has to match speed with the wave. If he doesn't match speed, he will never be able to ride this wave. And so then when you match speed with a wave, you can actually be carried everywhere. And the same happens for stars. Our waves are the spiral pattern in the galaxy. And if stars match the speed of the spiral pattern, they can be transported off to anywhere. And that's what I'm showing to you here. This is a sample galaxy in a model with a nice spiral pattern. 
And what I'm plotting on the right-hand side, just for the three different populations of stars, is the angular momentum change versus the original angular momentum of the stars. And stars that rotate with the same velocity of the spiral pattern are near that blue line, that's the co-rotation resonance. So if you're near the co-rotation of such a pattern, you get distributed throughout the entire galaxy. There's a little trick to it. Um, you know that's a time-dependent potential, so energy isn't conserved. It's non axisymmetric so angular momentum isn't conserved, but you can go into a rotating frame where it is time-independent, which is the Jacobi identity, and uh, th that delivers the Jacobi identity as a conserved quantity. And what the important thing, message here is, is while you get distributed in a large manner, your actions, or essentially your random energies, don't change. So stars stay on the same kind of circularity of orbits that they were before they entered this ang angular momentum exchange. And this is just one pattern. If a galaxy has many patterns, the whole thing will look like what you see on the top left side. So you can make an analytic description of this. And you saw this pattern has a maximum near 3, 4 kiloparsecs. And when you do this, just take the tumor instability. Uh, take the critical wavelength, the gene's wavelength into the disk, you have the frequency multiplied, and you get an embarrassingly uh, simple result that your scattering is just proportional to the surface density times the radius. And even more embarrassing, nature does exactly that. So it matches stars under these orbits. So how can we observe this? I told you metallicity and codes where stars are coming from. The metal-rich stars on the right-hand side on this plot are from the inner galaxy. The metal-poor stars are from the outer galaxy. The very metal-poor stars are really old. And in between, the dashed lines here show you a model without this migration process. And you can then just adapt one single parameter, which is this k, <coughs> the strength of the migration process, and you ob obtain a perfect fit to what we observe in the solar neighborhood. So with this metallicity distribution, we can measure how much migration there was. Just to show you, this is how stars redistribute after 10 giga years on the x-axis, you see the radius. On the y-axis, the migration, uh, the probability to find the star there. And this is just the normal radial migration churning. And you see stars distribute all over the disk, not completely. You still remember <coughs> as a population where you were, but their members are found all over the disk. This, for comparison, that's just to the random motions of stars, which is in order of magnitude smaller as an effect than this churning process. And this is um, with the dashed line. We show the prediction from the data. This is just a realistic n-body model. And again, it's actually surprising how close those things are to what you obtain from a simple n-body simulation of the system. OK. Now we can go into the history. Um, once upon a time, which is 1985, uh, Gilmore and Reed found that the Milky Way has a thin and a thick disk. So if you fit it with exponentials, so this is the altitude above the plane. I plot the logarithmic densities of stars above the plane. This is from SDSS, the first big photometric survey of the sky in modern times. And there you see um, that this disk profile can be fit by two exponentials, a thin and a thick disk exponential. And paired to that, people found approximately at the same time in 2000, um, around 2000, that when you look into the chemistry, um, this is again your metallicity from left to right, and on the vertical, this is an alpha element, a multiple of the alpha core. And when you do that, you seem to have two components, one old up here, one young down here near solar abundances. Where are those coming from? This is just a simple evolution model, chemical evolution model, just focus on the main lines. You have cool gas that forms stars. The stars have to explode to free uh, their yields and ga give gas back to the ISM. And so you have two channels here. One are the massive stars, and those are rich in alpha elements. So they deliver all your titanium here, or the calcium, or oxygen, etc. And the other stars 
that come onto the other channel are the supernova 1A. They need time. You need a binary system, most likely, and uh, you need to form a white dwarf before it can explode. So those have a time scale of order one giga year. So when the system starts, it starts off on the left top edge and then runs down along chemical evolution lines, which look approximately like that. Those are the black lines in this plot. And depending on where you are in the galaxy, that's again our galactic abundance gradient, you follow those lines and on the right-hand side you have the inner galaxy and on the left-hand side you have the outer galaxy. And the ridge that you observe in those data on the bottom is actually built up by a radial migration. It was very difficult to, be, to explain before we had radial migration as a concept. Okay, so what can form this thick disk? What we see from that, it can be formed very naturally, and we need a process to puff up the stars, and actually churning is one of those processes, because if it brings out stars from the inner galaxy to the outer galaxy, the scale heights scale like that. It's just, as a description, when you put gases to behave almost like a gas, when you bring gas into less of a constraining potential, it expands adiabatically. And the same adiabatic expansion happens with populations that go out to the outer disk, that you have a lower surface density, less retaining force, and your populations just expand. And can this actually produce a thick disk? Well, this is just a calculation of bringing stars to the outer disk. The dashed line is without the churning or without migration. And this model just produces simple exponential disks. And when I switch on migration, I get this thick disk component into the outer regions. But that's not all. I mean, we now know that migration can do that, but there are two big ifs. The one question is, is the inner disk hot enough? I mean, to expand it sufficiently, you need kinematically hot large random motion stars into the inner regions that you bring out. And the second question is, do those guys really want to come out? And that's what we call the question of preferential migration. So we have some um, n-body experiments. What you can look at is just the dispersion of your system, velocity dispersion over time. And you see that over time in the data, it increases, it flattens out. When we do that in n-body simulations, uh, this is just simple, simplified disk models from Alma et al, what you see on the top left. You have exactly the right behavior but those models didn't produce a thick disk. So the question here is, of course, these models didn't produce enough heating of the inner disk to produce a thick disk. And the other question is, this preferential migration where Asira did something on this, and they found that mostly the cool stars, so stars with low random motions migrate. And if this process is dominant, we don't know how strong those two factors are. It can prevent the formation of a thick disk via migration. But we will need Gaia data to decide that, because with Gaia, this plot, which looks really blurry, will reveal to us the time history for every single population. And when we compare this with the expectation, then we know if we form a thick disk. Just one last thing. People have found inverse gradients into the thick disk, so it seems like the metal poor stars are further in than the metal of rich stars. And same in Segway, when you look at the plot, this is again your alpha plane, and the low alpha stars are the right way around. The high alpha stars just have the wrong relationship. And when you compare that, Things can actually be the other way around in nature. And what you can do is, while a model has always a negative abundance gradient from inside to outside, you can actually first form stars on the inside and then stars on the outside. That's inside-out formation in galaxies. And when you do that, you can write that down analytically, but what you get is two integrals, essentially that tell you once is just the average gradient over time, that's boring, but the other one is the metallicity times the star formation gradient over time, so that's an inside-out term. And when we compare those two in their effect on the gradient, green is the average gradient, that's negative, but the inside-out term, because of the disk grew while it was forming, having more metal poor stars in the beginning and in the center, that balances your gradient so that you get a neutral gradient in the end. And 
that same thing appears into the kinematics. This is ion content versus rotation speed. Into the thin disk, young stars are in blue. They have the right relationship for the thick disk. This reverses. And currently, what we see for this is that um, this is just because of the sample errors. I've just folded my plot here with the sample errors of the currently biggest survey with Gaia data. And so we see the same qualitative effect, but what you also see here is the importance that we get those precise data. Because currently all we can say, hey, this happens, and we have actually found an explanation, but we can't say anything more. And so let me conclude with a little statement. We feel like in a German fairy tale. This is star money. Stars are raining from the sky and forming money for the girl, for the poor girl. And we get a lot of them because we get a lot of data. But there are two problems. A, those data aren't fully homogeneous, and we will have a great deal to do to get all our different currencies, sorry for the pun for the Brits, um, into one single currency that everybody understand. And the worst problem is things can go horribly wrong. This is just one example of the most horrible bias that nature did to us. That's calculation of the standard of rest. Ask me if you want to know more. But with a blue arrow bar, nature faked a straight line. We expected a straight line with simple models. With more complex models, we found out that the straight line shouldn't be a straight line. And suddenly, those stars on the left made more sense, which we had dropped out. And what happened with this is we had before that a very high precision measurement of the local standard of rest of the solar motion that was wrong by 20 sigma. And so we have to be extremely careful when our Poisson errors vanish, because that's just the first of many examples where we get results which are precise, and then we know afterwards that we are wrong by 20 sigma or more. And so, getting back to star money, if too many, too big stars fall from the sky, you get into geology again. <laughs> and that's what I look, would like to leave you with. Okay, we have very brief time for one or two questions maximum. Do we have any questions? Yes. Uh, do you distinguish between the spectral time of stars? Because if you use early, early height, like giant, and this scale height could be less than 100 BC. Yes, of course. That and is. You can't see the, the, the thick disk. Of course, which is also what we see in the other plot. All the thick disk stars are relatively old. Okay. Uh, what we need to know, though, is the precise age distribution okay. of those. What uh, this was from the SDSS catalog, um, and the spectroscopic data were from Bensby et al. That was a by-hand spectroscopic study, because by machine you see what I showed you with the Rafe Poulot. Yeah, uh, thank you both. Uh, this was a confirmation that I heard him write about the surfer. Uh, he has to have a certain speed, for example. It has to be faster then to keep up with the wave. Is that what he said? He has to have the speed of the wave to couple into the wave. Right. So he has to have approximately the same speed of the wave when he enters. And that's exactly the same that happens for the stars. <laughs> okay, we have to move on. Thank you very much indeed, Ralph. So the second uh, Winton Capital Award now for geophysics uh, is given by Dali Kong of the University of Exeter.